Hello, and welcome to Fellowship Church Rouge Park. We are so glad you're here. If you're a first-time guest, thank you for joining us. Privilege this morning of celebrating uh, some baptisms, the baptism of Michelle and Anne. And we're so happy that we are here today with you. Uh, they have responded to a call of the gospel by repenting of their sin and putting their trust and faith in Jesus and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for salvation. So they'll be giving a testimony uh, momentarily, and we'll encourage you to listen how God brought each of them to believe and, uh, and how they believed in the wonderful truth of Jesus. So we are going to rejoice with them as they come to publicly profess their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and obey his commandment uh, to believers, and that is to be baptized. So fundamentally, just a little brief on baptism. Baptism is an outward physical sign of an inward spiritual reality. Nothing magical or supernatural takes place because someone is immersed in these waters. Uh, the act of baptism does not save you, but only is a symbol pointing to the greater reality of salvation that happens to us through the Lord Jesus. You can liken it, liken it to a wedding ring that in and of itself does not make you married, but serves as a sign to the world that you have committed yourself in marriage to your lifelong spouse. Therefore, baptism is a beautiful picture given by the Lord Jesus Christ that points to the spiritual transformation that takes place when one rightly responds to the gospel message. Romans 6, 1-4 teaches that baptism serves as a visible picture of our death, burial with Christ, along with our spiritual resurrection with him. And that it identifies us with him as representative of as being children of God and one with Christ Jesus. In addition, baptism not only identifies the new believer with Christ, but also as members of God's people, of his body, of his church. Baptism is the second step in the life of a professing believer. It is both joyful obedience and a privilege to obey the Lord. So I'm going to ask uh, both of you to come for a moment. Michelle, actually, let me just get Michelle first. Sorry, Michelle. Thank you. I'm going to give you the mic, and I'll have you share with us your testimony, okay? Hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is Michelle. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm Michelle. I'm from Indonesia. I'm an only child, so my family's pretty small. It's just my mom, me, and my dad. And my dad converted into Christianity to marry my mom, so it wasn't really like a Christian household. Um, for the first about nine years of my life, I've never been to church. It was only when my religion teacher in grade three asked me to go to church that I went to his. And because of that, me and my mom went to church. My dad never came to church. Throughout this time, like I knew of God. I knew of like the scripture. I knew the general idea that Jesus died for my sins. But I never knew who God was. If anything, all I knew about Christianity was that it was about rule keeping, deeds, and I went to church because I wanted the relationship. But it wasn't a relationship with God. It was a relationship with my best friend. Sorry, not relationship like that, like friendship with my best friend. <laughs> Oh <laughs> yeah, I went to church because my best friend went to church and I got baptized because she got baptized. So I was like, why not, you know? And I remember as I was getting baptized, I couldn't hear what my pastor was saying. And he was like, oh, don't worry, just say yes. And I was like, okay, I'll just say yes. So now looking back, I know like that was not the right way to get baptized, right? It should be like a public proclamation for your love for Jesus, and I unfortunately did not do that. And afterwards, I still went to church, but I knew I was still very spiritually lost. And then I turned 18. Oh my gosh, I'm right there. I'm so sorry. And then I turned 18. 
it was time for me to go to a different country, go to university, and move out. And all my life, I was looking forward to this. Because like being an only child, I guess your parents are always like looking at you. And to me, this was my way of escaping that. And I wanted to live my own life, and I wanted to be free, going out to party, having fun, and all the stereotypical wild college lifestyle. And then I actually moved, and reality was not that great. The transition period was really, really tough on me. Oh my gosh. I miss my family, my friends, and everyone I knew and loved. And I didn't realize how hard it was to move until I was crying every day for the first month I was in Canada. And at the time, my boyfriend of three years, who was my everything and my joy, had also broken up with me, telling me that the relationship wasn't God's will. And instead of turning away from God, I actually turned to God. And looking back, I truly believe that that was the Holy Spirit working in me. As I was looking for a coping mechanism, I could have easily went partying or done all these crazy things. But instead, I reached out to a Christian club on campus called Power to Change. But it wasn't that easy. I still struggled. Every time I'd go to class, I'd pray that God would give me people to love, especially friends. I seek pleasure in people and in interactions, basing my value based on what others think of me. This led me to a downward spiral, thinking that I was unworthy and unlovable. And now in that period of loneliness, I realized just how much God wanted for me to get to know him and all my friends. In his word, the parable of the lost sheep perfectly explains this. He left his flock to find me, a lost sheep, a lost sheep who looked for worldly things for love, freedom, and self-worth. That ultimately left me empty, confused, and frustrated. I know now that only Jesus can fill that void. Only he can give me a true understanding of love, joy, and freedom. I'm no longer a slave to my idol sins and addictions. I am now a child of God. And I'm so thankful to have met my P2C friends, my family, and also my church family. And it was through you, brothers and sisters in Christ, who patiently and so lovingly helped me get to know my father. Now I can say that I love him, and I know my father, and I love him because he first loved me. And friends, I'm so excited to get baptized. <laughs> If you know me, faith is such a huge part of my life. I know my non-Christian friends can attest to that. <laughs> I've talked about my faith a lot, and truly, I just want my life to revolve around him. Like, it's not fake. Like, I genuinely just love God, and I'm just constantly in awe of who God is and his love. Like, Jesus endured torture, mockery, and death because he loved us. Like, he is God. He can literally stop all this. And he was like, no, they're not worth it. But it is because he loved us so much that he endured all this for us. And all I want to do is glorify him and make you guys know how much, how much he loves us. He, he cared for me even when I'm a little minuscule dot in this little, in this little, in this really big universe. He cared for me even when I fell short, even when I sinned, even when I turned away from God and relied on my relationships. And God never give up, gave, gave up on me. And because of this, I will continue to bravely speak about God because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Thank you. Thank you, sister, for that heartfelt testimony. Thank you so much. When we don't don't worry about the tears because you're not the only one, as some of you may attest to. Um, so we're gonna call Anne up here to share her testimony again, or for the first time. Good morning, Happy Easter. Um, so my name's Anne, and I was raised in a Christian home where my parents. <coughs> made sure always to tell us Bible stories and teach us about who Jesus is. 
um, they took us to church whenever there was Sunday school program or summer camp or any other opportunity. And because of that, I learned a lot about God and the Bible. Um, I remember winning prizes in Sunday school for finding the reference first or getting good grades in my school religion class because I knew all the right answers. Um, I was proud to tell everybody that I was a Christian and I thought I was doing a great job of showing it too. <clears throat> but the truth was, although I liked the idea of God and what he did, I didn't really know him. In the years before high school, I made lots of friends at school. Um, I thought they were really cool and I wanted to fit in with them, so I started copying the things they did. Um, I would speak aggressively and make fun of other people and basically just behave in whatever way um, they wanted me to behave in. Um, I was losing my identity trying to become the person they wanted me to be um, because I didn't feel loved as I was. So at the same time, I was still going to church three to four times a week and saying all the right things on Sunday morning and proudly declaring myself a Christian at school. Um, however, I still didn't really understand what I was hearing about in church. I knew that God loved me, but I didn't really feel loved. Because of that, I copied my friend's actions at school and acted the right way at church, thinking if I wasn't loved, I at least wanted to be well-liked. Um, I was looking for approval and acceptance in people who were never meant to fill that space, and that's what kept me separated from God. Um, I first began to notice that something was missing in my life when I got more involved in my church community. I made friends who were Christians and who lived very different lives than I did, um, and they were a real example of salt of the world. So their love for Jesus was clear in their words and their actions, and they were quick to extend that love to those around them, including me. Seeing the difference and light in these people made me realize um, that I was missing what they had and that it could only be obtained through a real and personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Um, God used his people to show me that I was being a fan and not a follower, that I was not being genuine or authentic. Um, I began to understand that the gospel is not that Jesus died for us so that we could um, pretend to do our best to be good, um, but that he knew we could never be perfect and still made a way for us to have a relationship with him. He calls us to come to him as we are and tells us that we are loved, accepted, and even worth dying for. I was tired of pretending to be someone else to get approval, and I wanted this genuine relationship with God. Thankfully, God reminded me often of Jesus' promise in Matthew 7, 7, that if I seek him, I will find him. I don't have an exact date for when I was saved. Um, it was a process, but I do know for certain that around the age of, of 13, I surrendered my life to Jesus, knowing that his ways were much better than the plans I had for myself, and that he has been making me new ever since. Um, although I had a very basic understanding of my relationship with God at the beginning, he's been teaching me that not only am I a follower of Jesus, but a child of God, adopted into his family forever with the Holy Spirit living in me, and that I'm never forgotten, forsaken, or alone. Um, through my Christian community and discipleship, I'm continuing to grow in my knowledge and love for God and others. I understand that I can love others freely because I was shown love without boundaries. Um, like it says in Psalm 34, I sought the Lord and he answered me and now I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. The Bible says that after we join God's family, we are to declare it publicly through baptism. So although I've been a follower of Christ for a few years now, um, God's been teaching me the importance of baptism. And today I'm getting baptized as a step of obedience and a public declaration of my faith and surrender to Jesus Christ. So stay up here, stay up. Michelle, can you come up as well? I'm going to pray for you. So can we just close our eyes and let's lift up our sisters, Anne and Michelle, up to the Lord. I want to thank you for sharing your testimony. And you have glorified God today. And, I, and we're, we're so happy along with you that you will be baptized. Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for our dear sisters, your children, Father God, who you have called onto obedience to be baptized. And we thank you for the work that you're doing in their lives. We thank you for how the Holy Spirit is sanctifying them day by day. We thank you that they are sharing your gospel, your word, and your truth with others. And we thank you for the testimony that their lives will be. Lord, what you have started in them, you will absolutely finish onto completion. And we have this great hope that uh, we will be with you, that we are your adopted children forever. And we thank you for that. And we ask for your blessing in all things that Anne and Michelle do, that they would do it onto you. We ask for your blessing upon their lives um, as students, as daughters, 
um, as friends, Lord. We ask that you would guide them, direct them, and pour your favor upon their lives. And even through suffering, tribulation, and trials, that they would continue to uh, depend on you, knowing that uh, in all things you work for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So we thank you and we lift your name, Jesus, up high. And we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Sam. Um, children are dismissed to Sunday school. So parents, please feel free to walk them there as they're sprinting. And um, as they are headed there, I'd like to invite you. First of all, if you're here for the first time, it's our great privilege and joy to have you with us. My name is Kay Savan. I have the privilege of serving this church. And um, we're honored that you're here. And we've been praying for you that the Lord, through his word and his spirit, would minister to you and that we would want to get to know you afterwards and pray for you as well. Um, I want to invite you to open up in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Our text for this morning is chapter 6, Romans verses 1 to 14. And uh, I want to invite you to read with me as we look at that. And then we'll uh, jump right into what God has to say in his word uh, for us this morning. Romans 6, starting from verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never again die. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, to members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are now not under law, but under grace. Amen. Father, we do pray that you would take this truth, and Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, you would apply it in our hearts, some for the first time, and others to encourage and to further establish onto greater faithfulness and fruitfulness. For Christ's sake, amen. Well, friends, I am truly grateful for the testimonies that we've just heard. Um, It is a wonderful reality of God's grace and his kindness to us. So what happens now that we are received in Christ by grace, as a gift? Do we simply go on living our lives as we did prior? I recently had an inquisitive young man whom I met for the first time as we talked about God within the first minute. He asked me, if I become a Christ follower, would I have to stop sleeping around? I'm glad he got right to the point. 
But I rephrased the question, and I said, I think you need to see the bigger picture of following Christ. I said, what you should ask is, what does it mean to live out a life as a disciple of Jesus? Yes, we're called to purity sexually, but that's not the only thing. Well, I believe today's passage will help us figure out some of those things. In fact, I would argue that this text emphasizes the following, and that will be our main point. That God's grace gives us hope for the future. It's a great hope, but also power to live faithful and fruitful lives in the present. There is a future reality that's promised to Christ's followers. And yet there's a present power given to us to live faithful and fruitful lives. Let me set the stage for us a little bit. When I think of the book of Romans, it is one of the most deepest theological writings in the Bible and also most practical books in the New Testament. There's three words I often think about. And that God in Jesus Christ justifies us in the right standing with God, that we are righteous by faith. And in this life, he sanctifies us, as the second word, that one day he may, we may be glorified with him. It is a wonderful picture. Today's text falls in the second word, sanctification. And before we hone in on the passage, I want to take a few steps back so we can see the big picture of this. I'm going to touch on chapter 3 and 5, and then we'll dive into our passage today. You see, on Friday, we gathered here to look back and to celebrate Good Friday. We gathered here as the fellowship churches, and Pastor Seba took us through Romans 5, the chapter previously as to what we're looking today. And we looked at the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross and why he willingly laid his life down. See, in Romans 3.23, we're told, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. That's the bad news. And that's what we need to come to grips with in this world. But then in Romans 6, sorry, Romans 5, we're told, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. In 5.8, but God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So first we were told of the reality of human predicament, that we are sinners by nature, that we are bent away from God from birth. That is our nature. That we reject him as our rightful king and ruler of our lives. And we constantly and daily seek after our own glory and not the glory of the Father. And because we're weak and because we're ungodly and still sinners, we're unable to save ourselves. We're in need of a cosmic rescue. And that is what God has done. That in his great love and for the glory of the Father, Christ Jesus went to the cross and died for sinners. And that's what we celebrated on Good Friday. And that's what Sam walked us through as he opened up our service. That Christ's death is the ultimate good for repentant sinners like us. That's what it's real and true. That he brought glory to the Father. That's justification. That God brought us right, made us right through Jesus Christ. That by faith we receive his righteousness. But once we are and as our sisters share their testimony, that they have come to faith by the grace of God, and we call it triumphant grace, that death cannot conquer. What happens now? And that's the second word, sanctification. You see, where the Holy Spirit grants us grace to live a pardoned life, that we may subdue sin and not give it to the former way of life, so grace not only saves us, but grace keeps on changing us, transforming us. In Romans 8, it says more and more into the image of the Son, of Jesus. Not more and more into who I want to be, but into the image and the likeness of Christ. That's what brings glory to God and joy to me and you. So when one has been bought and brought into the saving relationship of Christ, we have a new life. The old is passing away. So we're not to go on living in moral anarchy, 
And so Paul seeks to clarify that in today's passage. And does the church a great service by unpacking the reality of new life in Jesus. So he has two main thoughts in these 14 verses. First of all, in the first 11 verses, Paul is emphasizing this. Number one, believers die to sin because we are united with Christ. Because we're united with Christ, we die to sin. See, he starts with a potential objection to this reality. He says in verse 1, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? You see, in the previous chapter, Paul talks about that. But there's more sin, there's more grace. And, and people sometimes have questions or they push back. Paul is saying, no. When a person is put right with God by faith alone, they don't somehow conclude that they don't need to live obedient lives afterwards. They don't somehow conclude that, okay, now that I'm, that I'm in, I can just do whatever I want. That's not true. Look at verse 2. He says, by no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? See, for Paul, the idea that a person could be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ and continue to live an unchanged life was a theological impossibility. That's what he's saying. We who have been given, in Romans 8 actually tells us, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me and you as Christ's followers. It is impossible for us to live unchanged lives if we have been called and if we have been saved, if we have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. See, because it's interesting, as, as someone put it this way, that God has decisively changed their position in their relationship to sin. That God has changed my position in my relationship to sin. Because the believer has died to sin in Christ. If we observe to suggest that they will go on living this way. In essence, Paul takes this question and answer and from verses 3 to 11 further explains it. In it we find insight about what it means when we die to sin and what is true about it. Look with me to verse 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So the Apostle Paul points the believers, the church in Rome, back to the image and the picture of baptism where they had taken the step to publicly identify with Christ. He uses it to reinforce his point of dying to the old and living to the new life in Christ. And as Sham, Sam early, early, earlier shared, baptism does not save us, neither does it magically destroy the power of sin. You see, in baptism, we are joined with Christ and identify with his death and resurrection as an outward physical symbol of the inward spiritual life in us now. So Paul is saying when someone becomes a follower of Christ, there's a type of death that takes place in us. And that's important to grasp. You see, anytime you attend a funeral, you would recognize that the burial scene seals the finality of death. Once the body goes and the ground is covered, that is the finality of it. We walk away, and it's done. People typically console loved ones a bit more and then depart. The body is gone, no longer alive, walking, breathing. Paul seems, he wants his followers to see that in Christ, we really did die to sin, the old self. That we must see it as the old has been buried, for all the right and glorious reasons. Not only believers united with Christ in his death, but we are also raised in his resurrection. Just as we read that Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. You see, God, the Father, is glorified in the resurrection of his Son. Because on it, in the resurrection, both the character of God and the justice of God is also put on display. In it we see more of him. So that we who believe in him might walk in a newness. Walk also is the word live, 
It's the way we live our lives in the newness of life. So when we do, we have gone from living for our own glory, my own praise, to bringing glory to the Father who sent his Son in order to die in my place and take my sins upon him. Therefore, as a believer, I'm not to go on living in the sin, living independent of God, or merely adapting a form or a culture of Christianity, where there's an outward appearance of godliness, but totally empty of its power in my ambition, in my desires, in the way I relate to people. That's dangerous. That's why the picture of death and burial is important. That death also includes to an outward appearance of godliness or a type of just following externally or a cultural Christianity. This is a spirit-filled life, and Paul wants to make sure that takes place. You see, it's simple, and it's not that hard to be a rule keeper or identify with words of Christian culture and motions. It can easily blind us, though, to a form of godliness and never be transformed. Look with me to verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, shall we certainly, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So we're once again reminded, not only are we given new spiritual and resurrection life in this life, but what awaits for us in the future, a bodily resurrection when Christ returns. Remember earlier I said, Romans in three words, if I was to, justification, sanctification, and glorification. And these three realities are so key for us as believers. So indeed, in the end, it is a win-win situation for us who are followers of Christ. So it's not incidental that Paul uses the imagery of baptism to help believers understand that we are united with Christ in his death, which we will experience a little bit when they go in the water, and we are resurrected in his resurrection when we come out. But Paul was concerned what flows out of this reality, namely, what were the results? So verse 6 and 7, it says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. That's a strong word, to be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. Look at the words he's using, and it's very understandable in his context, right? Slavery, mastery. Paul is using some really strong words here to get the point across. He says, we should be no longer slaves to sin because sin's power has been broken in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's been broken. You see, Romans is so helpful to remind us that theology is not just abstract, but it's immensely practical. The point being this, that our identification with Christ means that we are no longer dominated by sin. That we're not dominated by that anymore. Sin no longer characterizes the believer. Rather, it is grace and resurrection life that characterizes the believer. When someone is living in prison, they learn to live according to that situation in that position. They're confined to the walls and the time and the routine of that prison. But when they're released back into society, they are to no longer live as though they are locked up in a small room or chained. They're not free to use their freedom with responsibility. It reminds me of my high school motto, freedom with responsibility. My principal is here to testify to that. How many days have I walked and I read that as I was leaving high school for five years? Until, until Christ saved me. And I realized that the Christian life has great freedom. Romans 14 talks about that. But with that freedom comes great responsibility. And it made a whole lot of sense to me. And so, it is true in the spiritual sense for the Christ follower that we have died with Christ and we are set free. But not to go back and live into sin, but use that freedom with great responsibility for the glory of the Father. 
Just to be clear, we will be tempted by sin until we take our last breath. Because we're not dead to our senses. However, sin has no more power to enslave us any longer. There is a dramatic difference. Paul does not argue that Christians do not sin at all. And some people in the past have taught that. Instead, the tyranny and the domination and the rule of sin has been defeated for us because we now are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. So it means the normal pattern of life for the Christ follower is progressive growth, sanctification, that we're making progress, that we're making progress resulting in greater maturity, conformity to the image of Christ, that we're bearing fruit in Galatians, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, that these things are increasing. I don't necessarily, I'm not concerned about the speed and how much, as long as we're seeking to make progress, becoming more and more into the image of Christ. Christopher Ash puts it well. He says, we're not free from sin's ability to tempt us, but we are free from its right to kill us. Sin kills. Grace gives life. And we have are to live as those who have been given life when we come to Christ. So Paul doesn't just isolate the death of Christ, but he does well to take us to the resurrection of Christ. Look from the verse 8 and 10. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. You see, in the gospel, death is followed by life. In the world, death, that's it. But in the gospel, Jesus goes to the cross, and yet he comes up. And he is risen and risen indeed. And for verse 9, For we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over us. So he has conquered the grave. It has no more power over him. So we belong and we're given the assurance of conquering death. Spiritual death. In verse 10, For the dead, he died. He died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. You see, this verse puts a strong emphasis on the finality of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. In his death, he dealt effectively and conclusively with sin, winning a victory that needs no second fight and needs no second foe. All have been defeated. That's the victorious king we look to. You see, Paul goes from pointing us to the cross and the empty grave to looking right at us in verse 11. It's almost like he's looking, he's pointing the audience, the church, to these realities. And then in verse 11, he looks to them and he says, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Because of these realities in the first 11 verses, 10 verses, he looks to them now and says, you, church, you, Christ follower, who's blood-bought, you must consider yourselves dead to sin. And in life to Christ Jesus. The time for self-centered and man-centered living is over. It's time to repent and believe in the gospel. It's time to apply the gospel and live out the gospel. After the Second World War, as you know, the USSR took a hold of East Germany and they built this wall. And uh, Today, there are museums found by the former locations, and they have many stories of those who sought to escape East Germany into West to find freedom of West Germany. But there is no single example of anyone trying to climb the wall from West to East so that they may go and live in slavery. So what we want to realize is this, to be freed in Christ is like living in West Germany. Why would a person who's freed climb back and say, I want to go live in sin? We must realize the great freedom we have given to live this way and to bring honor to the Lord. What I want to do as we wrap up is we want to take everything that we've sought in these 11 verses about a believer's union with Christ in his death and his resurrection, 
and see how verses 12 to 14 lays out some application for us. So here it is, number two. Believers must put, must put our new status into action. Some imperatives here for us. We're called to respond. But how do we respond? Look with me to verses 12 to 14. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but, turning point, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. So he begins at the negative. Let not sin reign in your mortal bodies. He commands us not to necessarily break the grips of sin on our own because it's been given to us. We've been delivered. We've been rescued. We've been ransomed. And because we've been bought from death to life in God's grace, we can now offer ourselves to God because we're under grace. We're not under the sentence of death anymore. We are under grace. See, we must see it this way. We are to enter into a freedom that has been won for us by Jesus Christ. That serves us as a reminder that no disciples of Christ on this side of eternity will ever live a life of sinlessness. I daily need to be reminded to not let sin reign in me. I daily need to be reminded that I need to offer all I am to the Lord as I submit to the Lord. You see, before we came to Christ, me and you daily made choices and every choice was in the state of spiritual lostness, separated from God. Every choice was outside of faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, all of my decisions was man-centered. All of my decisions outside of Christ ultimately leads to sin. I only cared about my glory and my comfort and the praise of others towards how good I was or how, how hard I tried. And the only true freedom I had back then was the freedom to sin, my slavery to sin. Those are strong words, but it is God's triumphant grace to us in the death of resurrection, in resurrection of Christ that has freed us, that has set us free that we may not live that way anymore. I recently read of a story of an old eagle that was tethered to a post by the owner, and people would watch the eagle walk around the post because he's chained to it and chained to it. One day the owner decided that he was going to undo that and let the eagle fly out. And so people gathered together to watch it. And as he undid the chain, the eagle continued to walk around that post, walk around that post. The same old rut, he was free to fly out, but he did not. That sad scene is like the Christian who continues in sin while being freed. And Paul says, that's not us. That's not us. Main point, God's grace gives us hope for the future and power to live faithful and fruitful lives in the present. So we must ask the question, what does this mean to us today? And how can me and you respond to it? If you're not a Christ follower, friend, I'm so glad you're here. Today we're reminded that all are spiritually separated and dead. We're only living for ourselves and according to our own terms. Me and you cannot undo the nature of sin in us by adding some religion, by keeping rules, by doing some good things. See, the world will try to keep and tell us, as long as you're a good person, you will be okay. But Romans 5 says we're weak, ungodly, and sinners. It couldn't be far from the truth. So we need to come to terms what God has to say in the Bible about human depravity, about our sin nature. We need to come to terms with the bad news of who we are. Enemies of God. That apart from the saving benefits of Jesus Christ, even our best efforts still means that we're living life on our own terms instead of God's new way. But friend, if you are like many of us and Anne and Michelle who share today, you look to the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ to pay and atone for your sins, then you'll be freed 
not just from the slavery of sin, but to enjoy God as your father. Live for his glory instead of our glory. That you are made in the image of God. That you are blood-bought. That you are adopted. That you are the ambassador of Jesus Christ to live until he comes back for the glory of Christ. Everything changes when we come to Christ. That's what it means to look to him. That we go from living as instruments of unrighteousness to instruments for righteousness. That is a supernatural miracle, the rescue which Christ offers to all who humbly look to him. You see, if the claims of the Bible are true, and we believe it is, all of it, then every minute that you give to consider this claim is worth it, friend. Satan doesn't want you to think about it. But we plead with you. We pray that you will stick around to talk of this and to come to terms with the gospel of Jesus Christ. A number of us would be honored to speak with you afterwards. For those of us who are disciples of Jesus Christ, we must remember this, that sin, you already know this, will keep knocking at the door. It will keep knocking at the door. But we must reject sin's trap. We must reject it. We must identify it and reject it. You see, sin has a way of trying to pull us back into the old ways. It will try to tell us that you cannot, you cannot escape this. It will remind you of past failures and sins, trying to convince us that we must sin again. It's, it, you, ha, you did it in the past, might as well do it again. You see, Satan has a way of tempting us, do it, do it, do it. And then when we do it, he has a way of accusing us, guilty, guilty, guilty. And we're in that rut. And Paul is encouraging us that we have been bought and set free, that we don't have to get into that rut. We can walk and live in freedom. You see, me and you must treat sin as the former jailer who wants to hold us in prison, called sin. But we must remember and tell that jailer, my sentence is over. I have been set free. So get out of my life. We must remember that when we're tempted, that he holds nothing over us. We are blood bought. Not only that, but we must daily remember our new identity. Daily. You see, in Christ, our status has changed instantaneously. Our awareness of our new identity is important, friends. We're called in light of that changed status. It has already happened the moment we repent it and look to Christ and His saving benefits. So our fighting against sin is different from living in sin. There's a difference. You see, the Scriptures never deny the ongoing struggle with sin, but the scriptures are clear that genuine, born-again Christ followers seek to live lives that are being changed by grace, triumphant grace. And so we're encouraged in verse 13, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. So how do we do that instruments for righteousness? Let me close by giving you just some simple ways we can do that. We don't have to over-spiritualize it. When we look at our entire faculty of our lives, our being, we are to take our minds. We are to offer that to God so that we would think and reason in the service of God. Paul says in Romans 12, do not be conformed to the world, but be renewed. We are to use our feet to take us to places where we do serve God. We are to use our eyes so that our ambitions and desires are to serve the Lord. We are to use our hands so we use our ability to make a difference in the world for the glory of the Father. You see, we use our capacity to love both the unlovable and the difficult moments in friendship and even enemies. We're to use our money as we use to serve God. Instruments of righteousness. Think about every facet of our lives. All of them become instruments for righteousness and for the glory of the Father. And when we do, in verses 16 and 17, Paul really sums it up in a good way. He says, but thanks be to God that you who are once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart. Indeed, thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray.